nothing are our earliest farmers more remembered than by the monuments to the dead which they caused to be erected. Lending distinction to the hilltops, as at Lordly Knocknoray in County Sligo, seated majestically above the plain, or as at Carrowmore, these memorials to the departed are the ever-living reminder of the love and perhaps also of the fear that men had for men in death. Sometimes the burial rite in these monuments was by cremation, sometimes by inhumation. The reason for the difference is not known. It may have been religious or may have indicated a social or a tribal distinction. Three kinds of graves of the Neolithic period are known. These are a single chambered grave called a kist, the small pit in the ground, and the megalith or tomb of large blocks of stone covered by a mound of earth or stone. There is nothing much to be said about a pit. A pit is just a hole in the ground filled with cremated bones and earth. Not many of these pits are known in the country. Kists of the period are also not common. About 10 only are now known. One of these is at Lincolnstown in County Carlow. Here, under a low mound of clay ringed by a curb of stones, there was a grave formed of eight large granite blocks sloping inwards toward the top and covered by two large capstones. In this grave were interred the unburned remains of a man 40 to 50 years of age and just under 5 feet 9 inches tall. He was accompanied in death by a fine polished axe and the shards of three or four decorated round bottom bowls. This is one of them. It is round bottomed, uh, decorated uh, over the whole surface. It was reconstructed, of course, in the National Museum. Has a sharply carinated shoulder uh, uh, which is decorated on the rim with, with zones of ornament uh, grooved into the plastic clay, sometimes in a ladder-like arrangement. At Roth in County Wicklow, there was another kist of the period. It was divided into two compartments, and in one of these there were the cremated remains of a young man about 23 years of age, and in the other compartment, a round-bottomed and ornamented handmade vessel of clay. This grave had been done into a small, dug into a small natural sand hill. The vessel, round bottomed with a shoulder with four lo little lugs projecting from the sides, was decorated over its whole surface as well as, it, uh, as on its rim with uh, impressed lines of ornament. Uh, near this grave uh, and in the same pan sand pit, in a pit, there was also a burial with another small round bottom vessel, this time with four projecting lugs which were perforated for suspension. The outer surface of the vessel, too, was ornamented completely with concentric lines ending up in a sort of cruciform design uh, on the center of the base. And other single graves like these were found at Drimna County, Dublin, where there was also this beautiful hanging bowl of pottery. At Martinstown County Meath, and at, at Norris Mount County Wexford and elsewhere. The most important group, however, were, uh, of, mon of monuments of the dead in Ireland were, are the uh, megaliths. Of these, four major types are known in the country, but whether all or any or only some of them were contemporary cannot yet be stated with certainty. The exact relationship, social, political, religious or architectural, which existed between the various types of megalithic tombs is at the moment a matter of research and indeed of some controversy. All told, something like 1,300 megaliths survive in Ireland, probably the largest number of any area in Western Europe, and many more have undoubtedly been destroyed throughout the centuries. Let us now look at these four most important groups of megaliths. There is, first of all, the group known as, the, uh, as Passage Graves, and these are so named because they consist of a simple passage uh, outlined by large upright blocks of stone leading into a central chamber. This is the simplest form of Passage Grave, and in Ireland there is a particular form 
uh, which is called cruciform by virtue of its shape. And it is so called because leading from the central chamber are two side chambers on the left and one on the right, which were used for the deposition of the burned bones of the dead, and there is a further chamber at the end. The second group of monuments, uh, of megalithic monuments, uh, are called court cairns, so called because in front of the burial chamber, or chambers such as here, there is an open forecourt uh, lined by large upright blocks of stone. And this is sometimes, as here, semicircular in plan, and sometimes three quarters of a circle in plan, and sometimes uh, a completely closed uh, oval or circle. Occasionally, too, the chamber at the back will be divided by transverse stones into uh, one, two, three, and even four uh, burial chambers. And the third group of megaliths uh, is the group known as wedge-shaped tombs, a name given, of course, by modern archaeologists, and so-called because of the uh, wedge shape in plan of these monuments. They are, as this uh, uh, instance from Bally Edmund Duff, County Dublin, excavated by Professors uh, O'Rear Doyne and De Valera indicates, uh, wider at one end than at the other, and here, usually, at the narrower end, there is a small chamber, uh, usually square in plan. And it is in this that the major burial deposits take place. And then there is the fourth uh, group of megalithic monuments, that which, in a way, is uh, most common on the countryside, because most spectacular. It is the group to which we, the name Dolmen is given usually consisting of three, sometimes more, upright stones, which one may here draw simply. <clears throat> this is an elevational drawing, and this is covered over by a large capstone, sometimes with little supporting stones underneath. And when one looks at these in the countryside, and there are so many of them, the belief is that these were always so, and that the burials were possibly deposited in the ground underneath. However, it is true that originally, and there is evidence for this, these two, like all the other megalithic monuments uh, of which we have knowledge, were covered by these large mounds of earth and stones and sods and other material, so that originally, on the countryside of Ireland and in the period of our, our first farmers, uh, these were simply grass-covered mounds of earth. And it was only the denudation of the centuries that has exposed to us uh, these uh, upright stones. One of the most important, if indeed not the most important, of the passage graves known to us in Ireland is that at Newgrange in the Valley of the Boyne. And at Newgrange, we get perhaps the best example of the manner in which these monuments were built. We have already mentioned briefly something of the passage and of the side chambers. And these were covered in a mound of earth and stone uh, held in position by these curb stones around the edge, uh, some three of which are elaborately ornamented. At Newgrange, as many of you who have visited the site know well, there was also, uh, there is still, the remains of a circle of upright uh, standing stones, as they are called, uh, some of which have now disappeared, but the sockets, as indicated in white, for which have been discovered. The, because the circle of stand, standing stones is not concentric with the monument itself, uh, it is thought possible that there is a difference in date between the circle of standing stones on the outside and the great megalithic tomb itself, uh, which is within this circle. Now, in describing the passage graves in a general way, uh, we talked about <coughs> the, uh, the long passage leading in. And here at Newgrange, the passage from the entrance here to the back is something of the order of 62 feet. 
Here is the position of the central chamber. And above this, uh, there, there is a roof which is now about 20 feet high. The passage was covered over by a series of flat lintels, and the central chamber and the, the side chambers were covered over on the corbel principle, that is, by the oversailing of one layer of stones above the other until the space to be uh, covered at the top is sufficiently small to be closed by a single stone. And the whole was then covered by a large and high mound of earth and stones, as I have already mentioned, and this formed the counterweight which prevented these stones of the corbeling collapsing inwards and filling in the central chamber and the side chambers. 